Father, with the holiness, Father, and that you require, Lord. And we pray that those of us who are hearing your word through her, that you would open the eyes and ears of our heart to receive all that you have for us today, so that when we leave here, we would share the good news and the truth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless you. <laughs> wow. Well, I just have to say it. I think Ed was supposed to preach, but okay. <laughs> let's just get that out of the way right now. I had so many excuses. I really did. Number one, my braille printer has been broken for six months, right? So everything I do, I have to do by hand. So there's really not a lot of room for editing, and you all know me. I used to be a, a, a music teacher, middle school. I like lesson plans, even if I don't use them, right? So, so there was that. I kind of made a lot of excuses. And the Lord told me, <laughs> just give the word. Just go from the scripture, and I'll reveal as you go. I did glean some things during the week, and I'm going to try to share them with you if I... If, if I can do it in some kind of order. But <clears throat> my faith, my sight. <laughs> How do you like that? To see or not to see? <laughs> did you see the title? I did. Now, it is the letter C, correct? Is it? No. When it says to see or not to see? That's not oh, that's not written. Well, the subtitle was this to see, as in, quote, the letter C, or not to see. And you'll know why later. And if I forget, remind me. <laughs> but, I, you know, I said to the Lord, I, I really wanted to talk about Thomas today. Because, you know, we, we've just gone through the ascension, or the, the resurrection, and I wanted to talk about Thomas and how his doubt turned to declaration, and I was all excited about it. I said, nope, I want you to talk. Speak to them from Mark 46. And I said, wow, Lord, I've never preached about a blind person except me. <laughs> this is a new one. I used to work at, uh, in West Roxbury at Boston Aid for the Blind, and I used to say, wow, I never worked with blind people. So it was, and, and now I've never preached about a blind person except me, so this is really kind of exciting. I'm going to start with Mark, beginning with 1046. And I, I have to, I, should I tell that joke I told you all before? <laughs> Because Mark seems to be, I mean, they're all books of miracles, but it seems like by the time we ha hit chapter 10 of Mark, we've gone through a lot of miracles. I mean, it starts right off in chapter 1, and, you know, we go with the, 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 the leper that was healed, and then the woman, the Syrophoenician woman, and then the woman who, who had an issue of blood, and it just goes on and on and on. And here we are at one of the final miracles of mercy in Mark chapter 10. But along those lines about miracles, here's the joke. Over in Ireland, there was a priest who was driving a little too fast, kind of late at night, more than a little too fast. He was pulled over by a policeman. And he rolls down the window, and the policeman says, Father, do you know you were speeding? He says, no, no, my son, I didn't know. He says, and the, and the policeman gets a, a whiff of the inside of the car. It smells like alcohol. And he's going, Father, have you by any chance been drinking? He says, no, my son. He said, well, can I see what's in that flask there? So he gives him the flask. He says, Father, it looks like whiskey. The priest says, Mother of God, it's another miracle. <laughs> so we come to another miracle. Mark, beginning with verse 46 of chapter 10. Then they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. <laughs> Good place for a beggar to be, right? When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, stand up, he's calling for you. 
Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. So, Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the power of your word, that it is a living word. It's active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So I recognize that without your grace and without your mercy, without your anointing, without your empowerment, anything I say is nothing. So would you come? Would you come, God the Holy Spirit? Turn your face in our direction. We worship you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we can learn a lot just from verse 46. Let's just use our Holy Ghost imagination here and insert ourselves into this story. So we're in Jericho, and it's hot, because it's always hot in Jericho. Well, it's always balmy, at least, but it's, it's usually pretty warm. And it's right before Passover, so the crowd is huge. It's immense, and they're just lining the road. And Jesus is there, and he's going through that city on his way up to Jerusalem, on his way up to be adored by the crowd on Palm Sunday, where they say, Hosanna. And a few days later, they scream for his crucifixion. We see in this story later on that crowds can be pretty fickle, too. So we're in Jericho, and it's hot. And alongside the road, there's a blind beggar. Actually, there are two blind men, if you read the account in Luke's Gospel. But only one is named. Did you ever wonder why Bartimaeus is named? Why wasn't the other guy spoken about? Maybe because after his healing and his conversion, as it says at the end of the story, he followed Christ on the way. He became a Christ follower. And he probably became one of the, early, the believers in the early church. Well-loved Bartimaeus. So people would say, oh, really? Bartimaeus? You kidding? But Brother Bart was blind? I didn't know that. No kidding. Wow. What a, convert, what a powerful story. Because wh why was he named? I mean, it just sort of made me wonder. We, we need to ask these questions. You know, inquiring minds want to know. I mean, if we ask, he'll give us the answer. We have not because we ask not. So I ask, why was he named, Lord? <clears throat> he was also named, Bartimaeus doesn't just mean the son of Timaeus. It means a son of dishonor or a son of an unclean person. Son of filth. Yeah. He was a blind beggar. Now, we know that blind people in that day were reduced to begging because, dare I call it the theology of the day, um, but was that blind people were under a curse. They were under divine punishment. That was, that was the strong feeling of religious leaders that day, that they were cursed. And, you know, some of that I have to inject here that some of it still comes down through the centuries to today. I always joke with you and say, uh, you know, when people say, well, have you been blind from birth? And I say, yes. And they say, oh, I'm sorry. And I say, well, you didn't do it. <laughs> but still, why are they saying, think about it, I'm so sorry. Like, it's the worst thing that could happen to a person. In a way, that judgment has come down. I'm so sorry. Oh, my God, it's the worst thing. I can't imagine. If that ever happened to me, I'd just die. Well, no, you wouldn't. You deal. <laughs> so we know he's blind and we know he's a beggar. We don't really know why he's blind. We don't know if it was a condition he dealt with from birth or if it was the result of a disease or maybe unsanitary conditions that robbed him of sight. We don't really know. But we just know that he's a blind beggar. 
And if you think about it, every time they called that man's name, they reinforced the fact that he was no good, filthy, cursed. You know, you're, every time somebody called, you're no good sinner, an outcast. You're, you're, you're wretched. Just a small step above the tax collectors of that day. Every time they called his name, that's what he heard. Son of filth. Have we been there sometimes? Where everything and everybody tries to remind you of what a low-down, no-good, dirty, rotten sinner you were in your B.C. days, your before-Christ days, and maybe how you still just don't have it all together even in your knowing Jesus days? <laughs> but praise God, church, that Jesus loved and died for us while we were yet sinners. We have a Savior, folks, who identifies with our wounds, with our areas of brokenness, he doesn't just identify man, but he took our wounds. <laughs> he was wounded for our transgressions. Huh? He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of, that brought our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we're healed. Yeah, he identifies with our wounds. We have a Savior who is vulnerable, who condescends to speak to us. He didn't stop speaking hundreds of years ago. He's speaking now. He's speaking right now because all I've got is this scripture in front of me. And he's revealing. And he's talking to us. <laughs> so when people try to remind you, you just say, I put up a no fishing sign a long time ago. So it's recorded in Luke's gospel as well that Bartimaeus, he hears the crowd going by, and so he asks what's going on. He's, you know, what's happening? What's hap and they tell him Jesus, now look at, the, they tell him Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. They don't say Jesus, son of David. I mean, I'm a slow learner. Maybe you guys got this already, but check this out. It's the first time they're only calling Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. They're only saying Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. But good old Bart has a different revelation. And he starts to cry out and he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David was the term for Messiah. He's not Jesus of Nazareth only. He is Jesus the Messiah. How do you think that revelation got put in his heart? Who do you think put it there? Yeah, say it, Sia. God put it there because the crowd sure as heck didn't know. They called him Jesus the Nazarene. And he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I knew I was going to hit that one of these days. Well, that's all right. I get excited. I, that's the trouble with sitting. You know, you try to move and you just can't. Well, anyway. So he calls out. And he uses that terminology, son of David. <laughs> wow. Do you know how many of you know that Jesus, before his crucifixion, had to fulfill the prophecy that said that he would be declared to be the Messiah? And it took a blind man. Come on, church. It took a blind man. <laughs> it took a blind man to see and apprehend what that crowd couldn't. He said, son of David, have mercy on me. And he didn't shut up. He just kept crying out. And if you look at the word in the Greek, it's a really strong word. It's not a whimper, church, okay? He cried out. He screamed. He yelled. He, he, it was a, one, one of the words. It's actually used um, as you would use a word for one who cries out in childbirth, a woman who cries out. Now that ain't no whimper, right? He's crying out, have mercy on me. And it doesn't matter what the crowd says. They're like, shut up, you beggar. I mean, they're trying to, to shut him down, and they're not doing it in nice ways. And he doesn't care. He's just crying out. He's being sternly rebuked, it says right here, that they sternly rebuked him. But he just cries out all the more, have mercy on me. He knows he doesn't deserve it. He knows who he is. Every time they call his name, he remembers who he is and that he doesn't deserve any mercy. So he thinks. But he cries out for it anyway. 
Who's telling you to shut up? Who's trying to take your voice and tell you just shut up and don't make waves? Okay, sirrah, sirrah. Things will be what they'll be. Nothing changes. Nothing ever will. Can't fight City Hall. Healing isn't for today. The church is a mess, and we'll just have to slog it out on our own until Jesus comes and takes us out of here. <laughs> no way! No way! Who's telling you to shut up? Now, don't get me wrong and come to me afterward and say, well, there's a place for silence. You're right. There was silence in heaven for a half hour. <laughs> And the Lord himself says, the Lord is in his temple, let the earth keep silent, right? There, there's a place for silence. But this guy, the Lord himself put that in his heart to do. Do you know that in, in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4, it says, we often just say, the righteous shall live by faith, or the just shall live by faith. Do you know what that verse really says? It says, the just shall live by the faith of God. In other words, who gave him the faith? The Lord. So if he gives it to you, do what he tells you to do. And if it means cry out, you cry out. I know I scared you a couple of weeks ago when we were in the middle of worship, and I went, ho! Well, I do that sometimes, but I'm not doing it to show how loud I can, can yell or that I used to teach junior high and can yell over all of them. I, tell, I do that for a reason, because he's... he's, he's on me in that way to respond to what he's doing. It's a call response thing. We call out to him and he responds to us. I mean, did you marry your spouse and then just not talk to him or her? Or say I love you to them and they're like, so? Yeah, well, I'm here, aren't I? You want a response, right? Huh? Same deal. Don't nod at me. You'll be done. Come on. You can talk to me. You guys are all like this. I'm like, come on. <laughs> you can talk to me. This is, this is a talking, you know. Eddie says you're not here. You're not. I think, let's see, what does my mother say to her fiancé? You're not using your listening skills. <laughs> they say that to each other all the time. <laughs> I have yet to decide whether it's listening or hearing, but we won't go there. <laughs> So we just keep declaring. I want to know, who's, who's told us to shut up? Who's told you to hold your peace, that it won't matter? Things are always going to be the way they are. We declare all the more, for the Lord is, he is able, just like the song says, he is faithful, higher than the mountains that I face. Every season I will press on, for God alone is on the throne. I want to tell you, every time you take another step to a higher level in Christ, you're going to be tempted by others to just shut up and give up. I'm telling you, my crisis is just a setup for a step up. When you go through another setback, you just say, ha, ah, I'm being set up for another step up to glory. I'm being set up for a step up. Repeat that. Say that. I'm being set up for a step up. Oh, come on. Do it again. I'm being set up for a step up. That's right. Brother Bart didn't listen to that crowd, did he? Yeah, I call him Bart. We blind people got to stick together. I know I'm on a first name basis now, you know. But he, he listened. He listened to the revelation that God had put within his heart. And then he cried out in that faith. By what he heard, he responded to what he heard. We need to do that again, church. We need to take back what the enemy's stolen from us and cry out and say, God, son of David, have mercy. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Verse 49, and Jesus stopped. There's another, another title for this, The Man Who Made God Stand Still. <laughs> that whole, that, those th four words, three words, would preach a whole sermon. And Jesus stopped. And he said, call him here. <laughs> 
So they called the blind man. Now look at this crowd. They're all like, shut up, shut up, shut up. Just be quiet. You know, he doesn't want to hear anything to do with you. Blah, blah, blah. And now they're saying, take courage. Cheer up. Stand up, man. He's calling for you. Oh, they, and they're pushing him forward. They're, they're helping him over. You know, they're saying to Jesus, oh, Jesus, I'm your man. You know, I'll help him. Yeah, yeah, we'll give you the help. Hmm. Well, thank God we put our faith in him, not in people. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Oh, well, that crowd, what are you going to do with them? Except we're a part of that, don't you know? <laughs> Humbling, isn't it? He's calling for you. You know, I never noticed this other call. By the way, the C's that were supposed to be in the title here, the first C, because, you know, we call it to see or not to see, get it? The first letter C is the call. He called out. Bartimaeus called out. All right, that's the first C. And I, I noticed there's actually four because the next one is that Jesus called him. He called him. He said, well, bring him here. There's a call and a response and a call and a response. And so it goes. It's a dialogue. Verse 51, and ants, oh, sorry, verse 50, throwing aside his cloak. Oh, my, 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 my. Do you know what that cloak was? What was it, Peter? Yep. It was the official identification that he had that he was an official blind beggar. And he could do this for a living. It was actually a cloak that was given out. I guess it would be called, uh, like today, I have what is called from the government a certificate of blindness. <laughs> wow. They need a certificate to figure that out? <laughs> Gee. I'm honored, man, you know. I, I have a lot of other certificates I'm a lot more proud of. <laughs> you know, like graduate degree, uh, undergraduate, you know, with, with certificate of blindness? What in the world? It kind of reminds me of when, when uh, science proves something that we knew all the time. Because we know the Lord, right? Oh, well, you got to laugh. You just have to laugh. So he throws aside his cloak. What's that mean? He throws away his identity. In faith, he's like, I'm done with this. I'm done with this vocation. I'm not going to be a blind beggar anymore. I am done. I am a new creature. He's already confessing it. Created. That's right. Absolutely. You want to come over here and do this? You go, girl. Good. She'll preach for me. So he jumps up, and he goes to Jesus. Now, clearly, he needed help. <laughs> and answering him, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? He emptied himself and took the form of a slave. If you recall, earlier in this chapter, the disciples, James and John, <laughs> came to him and he asked them the same question. They said, Lord, will you do something for us? And he said, well, what do you want me to do for you? And he, they said, oh, we want to be a left and right hand when you come to your glory. We want to be on your left and on your right. Totally different here. Jesus is modeling what he said to them, if you want to be the greatest, you be the least. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? He's emptying himself and taking the form of a slave and asking this supposedly cursed, under judgment, under punishment person, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. Now, <clears throat> some translations just say, I want to see. So we're not really sure whether he had sight before or whether, but it doesn't matter. He's making his point. I want to see. But how that, I want to just, how many of you know that he saw, Bartimaeus saw the Lord before he ever saw the light? I'm going to say that again. Bartimaeus saw the Lord before he ever saw the light with his eyes. With eyes of faith, I see Jesus, and I can touch the wounds that made me whole. Somebody wrote a song like that once. 
So he says, I want to regain my sight. Here's another C word, and uh, it's the word claim. And when the Lord first showed me this, I kind of backed away from it. I'm like, what do you mean claim? I don't want it, to, it's not one of those name it, claim it, blab it, grab it type thing. And, you know, he said, well, be careful you don't judge. He said, this claiming, let me find it, because I, I did write this down. Where? I know, I know, I'm looking. Senior moment here. Oh, for heaven's sake. Ha! He said, the claiming of which I speak is more like a declaration. Bartimaeus was declaring what he already knew to be true in and of me. So he was declaring what he saw was his already. His cry for mercy moved my heart, and his cry of faith moved my hand. I'll say it again. His cry for mercy moved my heart, and his cry of faith moved my hand. Oh, church, I want to be one who moves his heart and his hand with that kind of a cry, with reaching in to what I see already and saying, God, I want to regain my sight. I want to regain whatever it is. might not be your physical sense of sight. It might be something you gave up a long time ago, something you laid down that you never should have laid down. What do you want to regain today? What do you want to get back? What? He's coming to you. He's coming to me. He's coming to us with this question. What do you want me to do for you? And so we pause and we, we reflect on that. Lord, what is it that I would say? What is it that I would ask? <laughs> and Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. And immediately, I love that word, immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. Wow. He began following him. He became a Christ follower. He became in body what he already was in spirit. And he put legs to his prayers and followed him along the road. And chances are, he became one of those believers in the early church. And that's why Brother Mark could write about him. There's so much in this small passage for us to glean. So we call. We are to call out and not quit calling. Seek and keep seeking. Ask and keep asking. Knock and keep knocking. We're to be like that woman, the widow with the unjust judge. Unrelenting prayer. We call. And then we come. We come to him. I don't know what that looks like for you. You come to him in worship, in prayer. What does it look like for you to just come, you and Jesus, and see him at your right hand, put a smile on your face, and say, Lord, what do you want to say to me today? And then we claim, we declare that which he's given us to declare. And we say with the hymn that we're going to sing in a minute, open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Thank you, Jesus. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, spirit divine. Lord, I thank you that right now you are walking in our midst, Jesus. You are walking in our midst. Jesus is passing by. And he's asking us, what do you want me to do for you? As individuals, as a church, 
as the corporate body of the Lord Jesus Christ in the earth today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the work that you're doing right now. For healing in body and soul and spirit and mind. Healing, grace. We speak grace to the mountains right now that are in our lives, and we say with that song, you are greater than any mountain, higher than the mountains that I face. You're higher than those things. You are on the throne, Lord. Take your place on the throne of our hearts. And we say, have mercy on us, son of David. We beseech you. We cry out to you that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we with all the saints would be able to comprehend the length and breadth and width and height and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen.